coming out tonight on a really Wednesday evening. Uh, it's nice to be here with you all. As Dr. Hanasek said, I'm Troy Rice. I'm the director of the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program. There are 28 national estuary programs around the U U.S. Um, and one in Puerto Rico. Uh, there are three others here in Florida. They're all over on the Gulf Coast or the left coast as I like to refer to it. Uh, and that's uh, Charlotte Harbor, uh, Tampa Bay, and uh, Sarasota Bay are the other three national estuary programs here in Florida. There's a whole bunch up in the Northeast, uh, in Maine and, and New Hampshire area, and then there's several out in California and uh, Washington as well. So, uh, I think we all know where the Indian River Lagoon is. It's a 156 mile long uh, coastal estuary. Uh, basically runs from uh, Ponce Inlet in, near New Smyrna Beach in Volusia County, uh, south to uh, Jupiter Inlet in uh, Palm Beach County. Uh, it includes three water bodies, the Mosquito Lagoon, which is uh, the northernmost estuary of the system, the Banana River Lagoon, which in, includes uh, the area of Cocoa Beach and Cape Canaveral, and then the entire Indian River Lagoon, basically from Turnbull Hammock all the way south down to uh, Jupiter Inlet. Uh, they, we did an economic study back in 2008, and we determined that the lagoon's value is about $3.7 billion per year to our uh, region and state. And uh, that's due to a lot of recreational expenditures for fishing and wildlife viewing and boating and, and things, as well as the amenity value for homes that live uh, on the lagoon or near the lagoon. Uh, by having a clean lagoon, those homes are worth more. Uh, and so that, that uh, value of those homes uh, are, is included in that uh, study. There's also about 15,000 full and part-time jobs that are supported by the estuary uh, each year. So it is a pretty significant uh, economic engine to our region, not only uh, an ecological uh, treasure, but an economic one as well. Uh, as I said, uh, there are 28 national estuary programs around the U.S. Um, it is a a uh, program designated by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and uh, our program was uh, designated by the EPA and the state in 1990, and we actually started the program in 1991. Uh, the NEPs are non-regulatory. Uh, we assist in protecting estuaries uh, by convening uh, management conferences of all of the stakeholders that are involved in the management of the estuary. And uh, we have about uh, 19 different organizations that serve on our uh, different conferences. We have an advisory board, which is made up of all of the counties uh, on the lagoon, as well as uh, several federal agencies, uh, some state agencies, and then we also have Citizens Action Committee and a Technical Advisory Committee involved in our program. And so basically we work to coordinate uh, a lot of the activities of those different or agencies and organizations and the stakeholders all up and down the estuary and uh, to implement our comprehensive conservation and management plan that was uh, adopted in 1990 and, uh, I'm sorry, 1996, and then, um, then we updated in, in 2008. Uh, the lagoon is a seagrass-based ecosystem. We use seagrasses as the primary indicator of the health of the Indian River Lagoon. Uh, it's a very shallow system, about six feet uh, max depth in, in many areas, and so that's an ideal environment for seagrasses to grow in. Uh, however, in the 1980s, we found that uh, most of the lagoon had lost uh, a lot of the good seagrass resources that we had, and we you know, began the studies to try and figure out what was causing this pretty significant loss in seagrass resources. Well, basically, we, we have determined that uh, um, it's the runoff primarily from uh, the watershed, uh, from the stormwater runoff and the discharges that we get from the uh, canal systems that were built in the 20s and 30s and 40s to drain the land for agricultural purposes and uh, for future development. Uh, in the 1980s, there was about 45 wastewater treatment plants that discharged their treated effluent to the Indian River Lagoon. However, in uh, 1990, the state legislature passed the Indian River Lagoon Act that mandated that each of those wastewater treatment plants cease their discharge to the lagoon by 1996, and all of those are in compliance with that act. So uh, the point source or the, or the wastewater treatment plant discharges really aren't that big of an issue anymore. There are a few wet weather discharge exemptions that still exist that allow a couple of the plants to, to uh, do some minor discharges if uh, their, their plants get overrun with, uh, with rainwater and, and, uh, and too much effluent, but uh, uh, that's all advanced treatment if they do any kind of discharge. And so we are fortunate to have that uh, source of pollutants removed from the lagoon. And so now we're really focused on the, on the freshwater and stormwater discharges. 
This uh, talks a little bit about the uh, altering of the watershed that occurred in the 20s and 30s and 40s. Basically, a lot of the uh, land along the lagoon uh, was drained for agricultural purposes, and uh, the original historic watershed of the lagoon was about 572,000 acres. Well, when the water control districts came in and dug their series of canals, uh, I think you, you're all familiar with those. We've got the C series of canals here in St. Lucie and Martin County. To the north, we have the main um, south and uh, north relief canal in the Vero Beach area. And then a little bit further to the north in Palm Bay area, we've got the uh, uh, C1 canal that drains uh, most of Palm Bay and a little bit of West Melbourne into Turkey Creek. So there's a whole series of canals that were, were dug along the watershed and really expanded the watershed, if you will, uh, to about 1.4 million acres, which was about 146% increase in the size of the overall watershed. So we've got a lot of uh, artificial drainage, if you will, going into the lagoon that historically did not go there. And of course, seagrasses, uh, I'm sorry, the stormwater harms the seagrasses pretty significantly. It clouds the water so that the seagrasses don't have the light that they need to grow, just like any other plant needs the photosynthesis. Uh, seagrasses need that as well, and anytime we get a large flush of stormwater into the lagoon, then that will uh, block the light that the seagrasses need. It will also introduce excess nutrients and fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides and things, pet wastes, and that will also cause uh, nutrient buildup in the lagoon and can cause uh, algae blooms that will also block uh, the sunlight from being able to, to reach the seagrasses. This is just a little cartoon depiction of, of what I've just described. Uh, again, the, the blockage of the sunlight to the seagrasses, excess nitrogen and phosphorus is built up uh, from the nutrients that are discharged with that stormwater pollution, and then uh, the harm to the, to the uh, benthic environment, the seagrasses, and the, the creatures that live along the bottom of the lagoon. Again, the results of that we see are the declines in seagrass beds, shellfish harvesting declines, uh, fish kills when we get the low dissolved oxygen events, uh, particularly during the summertime months and the early morning parts of the day. And we've also seen a, a loss in commercial and recreational fish species as a result of all the discharges we've had over the years. So what are we doing to address all of this? Well, we've been working with uh, a lot of the stakeholders and local governments up and down the lagoon. Uh, we monitor the water quality in the estuary pretty significantly. We have a number of uh, stations set up throughout the estuary that we go out and do uh, monthly water quality sampling. Uh, we also have uh, seagrass transects in the lagoon where we have set uh, transects that we go and measure the length and the density of seagrasses uh, in the lagoon and measure that uh, and compare that to uh, past uh, years uh, seagrasses. Uh, we're working with uh, local governments to put in stormwater retrofit projects, uh, stormwater ponds and baffle boxes and swales and things like that, just to slow the stormwater down, treat it a little bit before it gets into the lagoon. And we're also supporting the Total Maximum Daily Load Program, or TMDL. That's an acronym you may have heard over the years. That's basically a, a DEP program uh, that sets the, the amount of nutrients in the lagoon uh, on a daily basis that uh, can accumulate and not have harm to the seagrasses. And so... Uh, there are uh, four uh, areas of the lagoon that have been determined to be impaired and therefore have to have uh, what they call basin management action plans developed uh, under the TMDLs, and that includes the Banana River Lagoon, the Northern and Central Indian River Lagoon, and the St. Lucie River Estuary are all uh, water bodies that have to have uh, BMAPs or, or basin management action plans developed. Uh, the reductions of the nutrients that are required under the TMDL program in the Northern Indian River Lagoon, we're looking at about a 22% overall reduction in nitrogen loadings, 44% reduction in phosphorus loadings. In the Banana River Lagoon, 40% of the nitrogen loadings have to be reduced, up to 62% of the phosphorus loadings in the Banana River, which is a pretty significant number. And in the Central Lagoon, from about uh, 192 Causeway, which is in the Melbourne area, down to Fort Pierce, We've got about a 51% decline in nitrogen and a 47% uh, decline in phosphorus uh, that is being called for under the TMDL program. Uh, the Basin Management Action Plans are currently being uh, drafted right now. and they're in the, For these three water bodies, they're in the third phase of that, and they should be coming out with the final plan very shortly. Uh, they're divided into three assessment periods or implementation periods, and so the first five-year period, uh, once that's complete, then the the stakeholders and the Department of Environmental Protection will get together, determine if we've met our goals during that first five-year period. Uh, if not, then we'll have to continue on to another BMAP, if you will, 
and continue the process until we reach the goal where the seagrasses are able to rebound uh, that we need. Uh, here in the St. Lucie River estuary, uh, there's a little bit different goal here in the St. Lucie. Uh, they're looking for a, a 0.72 milligrams per liter uh, concentration of nitrogen and a 81 micrograms per liter of total phosphorus. So uh, the St. Lucie estuary TMDL is not based on the seagrass habitat as it is in the Indian River Lagoon. It's more of a concentration number that they're trying to achieve in the St. Lucie, since the seagrasses aren't as abundant in St. Lucie as they are in the Indian River Lagoon. Uh, that equals about a 30% reduction in overall nitrogen discharges to the St. Lucie, and about 110 metric tons per year reduction uh, in phosphorus from the freshwater canals. This, again, the sea series of canals that drain uh, into the uh, St. Lucie River estuary. Uh, that TMDL was adopted in 2008 and they're still working on their basin management action plan uh, for the St. Lucie estuary and hope to have that done probably early next year. So what does all this add up to? Uh, over the past 20 or so years, we've expended over $80 million on projects to improve water quality and habitat in the lagoon. Uh, over 70 construction projects in the watershed to again slow down and treat the stormwater runoff. Uh, 25 planning projects with local governments basically developing stormwater master plans in their communities so that they know where they need to put the fixes in order to uh, inc increase uh, water quality in the lagoon. Uh, a lot of environmental education projects uh, that we do and we've also uh, funded a uh, grants writer since 1999 that has brought in uh, quite a bit uh, of money to uh, the lagoon through 319 uh, grants, through TMDL grants, through Florida Forever grants for land acquisition, about $200 million worth of, of capital and preservation dollars have been brought in through our grants writer uh, over the past uh, 10 or 20 years. So it's been a, a very successful program, but we still have quite a bit more to do. Just uh, briefly go over some of the uh, stormwater treatment type projects that we've been implementing over the years. Uh, these are the, probably the simplest thing that you can do is the stormwater swales in the front yards and the backyards and the small little retention areas that basically captures the stormwater, allows it to percolate back into the ground, recharges the aquifer, and also keeps that stormwater from uh, reaching the lagoon. Uh, baffle boxes or sediment traps, we put in a number of these up and down the lagoon uh, with the local governments. These do a real good job at capturing a lot of the sediment materials, the soils and things that erode uh, off of the yards and whatnot, um, collects a lot of the floatable materials as well, the trash, the leaf litter and things. It doesn't do a real good job at capturing a lot of the dissolved nutrients in the water.